other way. You can get lucky. You could be like, oh, I looked at my analytics one day and it told me that um, I'm getting a lot of traffic from ads. Uh, so I spent more money on ads and I got more conversions. That's getting lucky. Um, that's not actually improving things. Um, and that happens. But to actually improve it for the long term, to see that 110 year trend and actually see an increase and not just a blip, um, it takes a lot of work over a long period of time. The other thing I want to make super clear is that checkout, and this is one thing a lot of folks will focus on the checkout um, and say, oh, well, you need to move this field here or you need to take out these things here. And I'll talk about some of that stuff for sure today because that is significant and important. Um, but the results that I've seen uh, start at visitor acquisition. Um, where you get your traffic from uh, impacts the effectiveness of your checkout more than anything you can do on your checkout physic. I mean, unless your checkout's broken. Uh, but as long as the checkout is working, the biggest impact that you'll see is where you get your traffic from. That's, the, that's where checkout optimization actually starts. Not all traffic is equal. Um, you can run ads, you can do email campaigns, you could do a lot on social, you can uh, put uh, links in lots of places that are outside of your website, whether it's on with partners, do content marketing with partners. If you are a product developer like I am, the plugin itself or the theme itself is the highest quality traffic you can get, period. I literally have not met a single product developer who says something other than that. The traffic that you get from inside of your plugin is the most highly qualified traffic that you can get. So all of us, myself included, who are super bothered by our WordPress admin that's covered in uh, notifications and whatnot, um, that is problematic. I don't like that experience myself. Um, but what is the reason? It's often because folks are trying to get the most qualified traffic that they can possibly get, which is in the plugin itself. Um, those notification banners and whatnot, that's not the best method of it, uh, honestly. And that's not what we do. That's not where we get most of our traffic either. Um, but um, the traffic I see coming from within the plugin is the traffic that does the best at the checkout without question by like a magnitude of 10. Um, so that's why I say that what I'm saying. And then making physical changes to your checkout, uh, whether you're using WooCommerce or you're using um, easy digital downloads or you're using Shopify, uh, which changes to the checkout there are almost impossible. Um, like significant changes are almost impossible. Um, and other uh, platforms, making changes to those checkout processes is challenging. It's totally possible with WordPress uh, options, um, but it's risky. You don't know for sure if those changes are going to be beneficial or not, and it's hard to roll them back sometimes. Um, and you risk um, introducing change that actually might introduce breakage in one form or another. So uh, while it's important to do physical changes to your checkout in order to get the best results, it's also the riskiest place. So that's why whenever I talk about um, e-commerce checkout stuff, I start with everything that's not the checkout first. Uh, again, I, it's almost like my title is a little bit clickbaity. Um, let's talk about not checkout in order to fix the checkout. Um, but that, it's really what I have seen in terms of the, the best uh, results overall. Um, so what do we analyze, actually? When we're using analytics to understand things, what do we analyze? The first thing, like I said, is the source. Where is your traffic actually coming from? Um, where are you attracting your visitors from? Uh, generic blog articles can drive a lot of traffic, for sure, um, but not a ton of conversions. So in order to actually start driving conversions with content marketing from your blog, you're going to have to do a lot of traffic. Um, and that's a, a, a risk you have to take or an investment you have to consider is if that's going to be one of my primary um, ways of driving more uh, conversions, I'm going to have to blog a lot and regularly and I'm going to have to spend a lot of time on that content. Um, I like content marketing a lot. It's definitely one of the things that has driven a lot of conversions for GiveWP in particular, but it is not free. It costs a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and you have to be strategic about that as well. Targeted advertising is another really good one. I actually like targeted advertising now 
before I did target a, a advertising, I didn't like advertising in general. Um, it's also fraught with privacy concerns and things like that. Where do they get all this data to know that I want a blue shirt and not a pink uh, shoe? Like, uh, well, it's because they are watching me in different ways. Um, but I can say I like getting ads about blue shirts instead of pink shoes. Um, so there's uh, uh, pros and cons there. Again, American living in Europe, privacy concerns is something that I think about a lot. Um, but um, the targeted advertising does have the opportunity to actually take, like instead of organic search, which can, is a net that's really huge, targeted advertising can say like, I just wanna try to get these people because I know that these people are interested in what I'm trying to sell. Um, and so ideally, if you're spending time there, uh, that traffic, even if it's a lot less traffic than your organic traffic, that traffic should have a higher conversion rate, absolutely. And if it's not, you're doing something wrong with your advertising. I'm trying not to look at the camera. I'm trying to look good. Um, um, if you're a plugin author, like I, like, like I mentioned before, the links inside of your plugin are absolutely the most valuable option you have, uh, or, or if you're a theme author. Um, but how you present them is really important. Um, I don't have a visualization for this, but if you think about the WordPress admin, and GiveWP has a, a, a menu on the side that says donations. Um, and in that menu, one of the submenu items says add-ons. And in my mind, what that does is it highlights to the person using our plugin that there's more that they can do. They can add additional stuff on. And so not a lot of people are going to click on that thing because they're like, I just need to build a form and move on. Uh, I got other stuff to do. I'm in my WordPress admin. I'm, I'm doing blog posts. I'm, I'm managing my users. I'm doing all this other stuff. I don't need to click on your advertising. But the ones who do click on that, that's where everything changes. And uh, you might be surprised, but a lot of people do click on that. They click on that, and then they see a screen that says, here's all the ways in which you can do more. Once they click on those buttons, I have UTMs on all of those things. Personally, I don't ship any links outside of my control. Like if it's outside of my website, if it's somewhere else in the world, it always has a UTM that does not collect private information. There are folks who use UTMs for malicious purposes, and that's why that's also a sensitive issue. But I wanna just get the source. Did this traffic come from my plugin, yes or no? If it did come from my plugin, what screen did it come from? Uh, I can get that as well. If it did come from this screen, which button did it come from? I can get that as well with UTMs. So every single link has a UTM on it, and I know with certainty which button in the plugin drives the most traffic and drives the most conversion. That's what you use the analytics for, um, is so that you can say with authority, is this even working? Does anybody even care about this screen? I know with certainty that it does, uh, and I know which ones are, 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 are the best. Um, that is by far the most valuable traffic that you get. Um, you can get really, really good at advertising, online advertising, and that traffic can start to rival this type of traffic, but I have never talked with a plugin author, um, and I have not yet experienced that paid advertising actually exceeds the revenue and conversions that you get from inside the product itself. Next, um, how, actually this is actually on the next slide, the entry pages. When you, now I've got traffic, I, I got their attention one way or another. I got some organic traffic, I got some paid traffic, I got some traffic from inside the plugin. Um, now, they're on my site. Uh, now, what am I doing on that page that they landed on? Sometimes uh, what I see in the WordPress ecosystem often is that folks are driving to a blog post which might be informative, which might be educational, but it doesn't actually do anything to drive conversions. Um, and it's not that it has to be busy and pushy and salesy, uh, but it does have to be educational, and it does have to highlight the way in which you can purchase. Those are the biggest things that I, that I try to always say, is if you're going to gain traffic and your business is e-commerce, then when they land on your site, you have to do a couple important things. Is your value proposition obvious? When they land on your site, are you informing them, educating them on why your site matters to them uh, in one way or another? Once you have their attention, are you able to keep it? Um, and that's with your, what your value proposition does. And then while they're there, are you educating them on the problem that you can solve for them? 
uh, again, it sounds weird to be talking about checkouts, but when you do these things, you can have a relatively bad checkout experience and it will still perform relatively good because you did all the right things before they got to the checkout. That's, that's the key message I'm trying to drive. And then when they're on that page, entry pages, are your call to actions, CTAs, are your call to actions explicit? Don't get cute with call to actions. Don't be like, let's get started. Um, that could mean anything. Um, if you're wanting them to buy something, say, buy my thing. And they click on the button that says, buy my thing. Um, because the worst thing is you say, let's get started. And then they end up in a checkout. And they're like, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not at all what I thought was going to happen. That means your checkout's going to have a lot higher abandon rate. Because uh, you got them there, but they're not going to stay there because they didn't want to be there in the first place. So don't get cute with the buttons. Buy now, purchase, uh, open your wallet, <laughs> anything that you want to say that makes it obvious that when they click on the button, they're going to be in your cart or your checkout. Um, I am going to have lots of time for questions. I love questions. I would actually prefer for these types of things to be conversations. Um, so uh, keep them in mind um, and, uh, and, and be ready for it. And then and last thing I'll say before I get into some nitty gritty details. Uh, when it comes to the checkout itself, uh, yes, checkout fields are important. Be minimalist with your checkout fields. Don't ask for their nephew's name and their social security and all these things. Like, don't ask for a ton of information. Really try to be minimalist when it comes to checkout fields. The fewer, the better. One of the uh, evolutions of uh, Stripe, the payment gateway that I have loved, is the way in which they're able to have a, a one field um, uh, payment area, uh, essentially. Um, that, that's been uh, a big game changer for a lot of folks. Um, do you need billing fields? Sometimes you really do. And billing, billing fields can be helpful to prevent against fraud and things like that. So, but you don't always need them. Uh, do you really need their phone number? You gotta think through that or not. Um, we actually do ask for a phone number, but it's not required. Uh, it's because we actually do physically call people after they make their purchase. Um, and that's an interesting conversation. That's another presentation. Um, is the checkout the best place for them to opt, in, opt into your marketing? That's a hard question that a lot of people say. Well, they're there, and I need them, and so I want them to opt into my marketing. But is that the best place to ask them? They're not, that's not their intent. That's not what they're trying to do at that time. They want to buy from you. They don't want to get spammed by you. Um, you really need to ask the hard questions of whether or not that's the best place to do, because all that does is like make them think about something that's not purchase related. And if you're making them think about something not purchase related in your checkout, you're increasing the chance that they're going to take off. Um, and then when it comes to payment options, do the opposite. Be a maximalist. And this is something that I'm trying to work on on our checkout right now. Right now, we basically have credit card and PayPal, um, which covers a huge portion of buyers. But more and more, there's so many options. I, I just went to go fill my tank at the gas station the other day. I could pay in 25 different ways at the gas station. It was overwhelming. It was a bit much, honestly. But I was like, G-Pay, should I do that? Should I just take my phone out and tap? I don't know. Should I put in a card? I have five different cards. Which one should I do? It can be a little overwhelming. But the reason why you do more of the options at the checkout is because you don't want people to not buy because they don't have their preferred payment method. Um, the art between adding a lot of payment method options without being overwhelming is a whole subject matter by itself as well. Um, and often it depends on your payment gateway and the way that they provide it. Again, I feel like Stripe is leading the way on that front. Uh, there might be other opinions about that, but the ability to do Apple Pay and Google Pay and um, uh, all the credit card options to do two checkout, uh, lots of German pay payment options as well, all within one uh, simple area with Stripe is pretty amazing. Um, so. You don't want people to take off because they want to pay with Google Pay, and you don't allow them to do that. Um, all right, so show me the checkouts. I have some checkout examples and a little bit of what I walked through. How much time do I have? You have 10 minutes. I have 10. OK, so we're going to go fast. So um, the give checkouts over the course of about three years. I'm actually going to flip over here to Figma. Um, and walk through it a bit. Um, uh, 
Oh, one thing I didn't do is figure out how to zoom in when I don't have my mouse. Mm -hmm. There we go. Cool. So this was our checkout a couple years ago, um, which is almost like the stock Easy Digital Downloads checkout. Um, it has everything you need. Um, and it's boring as hell. <laughs> um, but being boring on your checkout is not a big problem, honestly. Um, sometimes being boring is, is helpful uh, because it is minimalist. Um, but we really felt like there's a lot that we can do here. And just as a spoiler alert, um, it's kind of confusing because you see a lot of down arrows here. But the, this one right here is the result. 64.65% um, uh, uh, decrease in drop-offs. These are the analytics that you want to pay attention, attention to on your checkout. Is add to carts is what it's called. When you get it, when somebody actually physically adds something to their cart. And then how many checkouts did you actually get? How many transactions did you actually get? With GiveWP, we don't have a cart at all. We go straight to checkout uh, because we're basically always only selling one product at a time. Um, not everybody has that. Um, so checking add to carts, cart to um, checkout, and checkout to transaction. In the case of GiveWP, it's straight to checkout. So we got straight to checkout, and then we got transactions. We increased that, that differential by 65% uh, because of these changes I'm about to show you. This was our first attempt. We, we first went at it with a design eye. We were like, let's make it more clear. And the, most, the biggest motivation here was the, uh, a key part of the checkout that I feel like is really important is that when they hit buy, it, sometimes what happens is uh, that you go straight to a checkout that's like, all right, give me all your payment info now. Um, but literally, sometimes they're like, but what am I buying? Even though they just click buy on your product page, they're at your checkout and they're not totally sure what they're buying. So on the checkout uh, or in the cart uh, or both, ideally, uh, there should be a way in which they have an overview of exactly what they're opting into. So we wanted to lead with make sure that what they're buying is front and center. Um, I don't remember who made the decision to put my face on the checkout, but um, uh, that happened too, which is weird. Um, but uh, that section there is about making sure that they understand you can buy and you can decide you don't want it anymore and that's gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. Um, that's a really important assurance. We wanted to make that front and center as well. And then the payment fields are isolated, really clear and obvious. Um, and then you could see Hopefully, you're already spotting a problem with this one because I just said a little bit ago, don't get too cute. Um, I got, we got cute, right? Get started with give. That's a purchase button. That's like they're going to finalize their, their purchase. And it says get started. Lesson learned. Don't get cute. Um, this is a next iteration. What we didn't like here is how everything felt uh, kind of too isolated. And like you have to scroll a lot to. Uh, to, to actually see everything and get down to payment information. Um, so we've tightened it up quite a bit. We tried to make it feel a little more cohesive. Uh, still all, all basically the same information, um, but, um, but it's a bit more cohesive here and, and definitely uh, more tightened up. And the other thing here, what we didn't like over here, you can see that the purchase button is actually physically outside of the area. And that felt like a problem for sure. Uh, so we got that inside of the whole area instead. And again, like I mentioned a long time ago, doing these customizations took a ton of effort. And each of these are things that we shipped physically and then analyzed, is this working? Uh, and again, so like I said, this isn't results that we did over the course of a couple months. This is what we did over the course of three years. Did you do A-B testing with these ones? We did not necessarily, not at the same time, not a, not a this checkout and then this checkout. Um, A-B testing requires a ton of traffic um, uh, to get actionable results and give WP as a niche. It would have taken us probably six months to get the amount of traffic that we wanted. Um, so instead we did more of just looking at the analytics before and after, um, but over a period of time as well. Um, and we knew that we were going to be iterating over a long period of time. So seeing the analytics change throughout the whole process was the attempt. Um, I would love to be able to have enough traffic to A-B test a checkout over the course of a week. Um, that would be awesome. If you're in that position, have at it. That's a whole other presentation. <laughs> 
Um, okay, and then this is based almost exactly where we are today. What we didn't like, uh, which you probably all intuitively understood too, we didn't like that in order to get to the payment fields, you really had to scroll down. We didn't like that. But we also didn't like that after you scroll down, you lose that uh, summary of what you're buying also. Um, we didn't like that either. So we were like, how, how can we have our cake and eat it too? Um, and we ended up with this two column layout for the checkout, which I was nervous about a two column layout, um, also for mobile and things like that. It's super common nowadays, it happens everywhere, um, but um, uh, it's been working all right. Um, and this is literally a screenshot I took this morning uh, of our checkout now. We have a, um, an upgrade option uh, at the top um, and a couple changes over here, strong uh, testimonial right there. I got five minutes, so I'm gonna do one more thing and jump into questions. Iconic um, WP is a great um, WooCommerce extension store. They've been using Freemius for a long time, and we just recently moved them over to WooCommerce, um, and the checkout is actually powered by an Iconic WP product called Flex Checkout. Um, and this is essentially the freemius checkout. So when you're on your marketing page, you can click buy now and this freemius uh, modal pops up and you can make the purchase right there. Um, and the great thing about that is you stay on the marketing page. Um, it's really just focusing on the, the payment information. It's, I, I, it's supposed to be quick. Um, and generally speaking, freemius does have uh, serve a lot of uh, vendors and they have a lot of data on how their checkout works. Um, and so I know that the way that they build these out is intentional and data-driven as well. Um, I, I do wanna say I, I like Freemius overall, but our business objectives really pushed us to, towards WooCommerce, and this is now the checkout that we have at Iconic. And I don't have the data because we literally shipped this two weeks ago. Um, but a lot of the things that I talked about in terms of how we influenced our GiveWP checkout was used to, uh, to be applied to this checkout. You can see that it's, you've got the two columns. What I like about the Flux checkout product that we're using here in WooCommerce um, is that you basically are getting a cart and a checkout all on the same page. So you can have multiple uh, products being added here um, and, and you could see your cart, you can see it up here um, with a description of what this product is. There can be multiple products here all at the same time. And you can actually be changing that information um, live right here and it updates automatically. We have the 100% uh, guarantee. Uh, it doesn't have to have my face or anybody's face. It could just be like, you get your money back. We have the trust pilot stuff. All these things are helping uh, to say like, if you buy this, you're gonna be good. Well, we got your back. Um, and then when you click to the next, um, you're, you're in the, the checkout while you still have the cart overview. Um, really simple fields up here. They're basically in line. Um, and then it even has an upsell here where you can add a second product at the same time. And we, the initial results that we've had within the first couple of weeks is that this uh, upsell is getting already an 8% upsell conversion rate, um, which I was really surprised. Uh, that's very high. I'm expecting that to actually go down. I'm thinking it's gonna be like two to 3% in the long run, uh, but initial results are really positive. So last things before questions. Um, show me the metrics, do I have time? Um, these are not our real numbers, um, but this is um, what is now called Looker. I think that's a terrible name, but it used to be called Data Studio. Um, all of this is populated by the weekly data that I pull out of analytics um, every single week, every single Monday, um, and this is what I do over time. These are not our real numbers. Um, but it's an example of what they look like uh, when everything is there. I have it set up so that right now it's showing an annual view, but I can break this down to do only week five. How was week five? Um, and there's week five information. Or again, I can just take all of it and see the annual and I see the graphs and charts. And I'm checking the website performance itself as a whole, our ad performance, organic performance, email performance, social performance, affiliate performance. Um, I am living in this data. This is the, the spreadsheet that populates that. Again, not our real numbers. Um, but 
this is what I'm looking at all the time. But I make this for everybody else to enjoy the numbers. <laughs> Most people don't enjoy this. I enjoy this. I have fun looking at these numbers all the time. But I make this a lot more tangible and nutshell oriented. And when I say, oh, we're seeing a dip here, they go, well, what does that mean? Well, let me show you. It looks like this. Um, that, so that's been really helpful and effective for me. Um, that was so fast because I'm almost out of time. And like I said, I love questions. So uh, we'll jump into questions. Um, Can we clap first? Because oh.